It is good to see you all, kind of, your eyes at least. Uh, grateful to be together with everybody. And those of you at home um, or streaming, grateful that you're, uh, that you're watching and pray that uh, be blessed this morning. We're still in Matthew. We're back into Matthew. So we're, we're kind of walking through this Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this morning we are in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This starts really a new section of the Sermon on the Mount that is, uh, is, is, I pray, I mean, it's been so convicting and helpful for me. Um, I'm going to read uh, Matthew chapter 6, kind of through verse uh, 7, but this morning we're only going to address 1 through 4. So let's read that together and then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left, know, left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, you have received, or they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray... Do not keep upon empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard, for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. And he goes on to the Lord's Prayer that Mike's going to talk about next week. We see this area in the Sermon on the Mount, and if you jump down to verse 16, he begins to address fasting. And so Jesus, as he's been doing in the Sermon on the Mount, is, is talking about what real, real righteousness looks like, saying it doesn't look like what you've been seeing from the Pharisees. It doesn't look like that. I want to talk to you about what real righteousness looks like. And he has launched through the Sermon on the Mount. And here we get into chapter 6, where Jesus really addresses through three areas of personal piety, three areas of, of, personal, uh, of, of personal piety towards the Lord where he, he talks about giving, he talks about praying, and he talks about fasting. And we see over and over as you walk through this chapter, don't do it like this, like you've seen with the hypocrites, but do it like this. What an amazing thing. We learn from the Word of God in regards to this. And this morning, I want to really key in on verses 1 through 4 with you. You know, our culture loves celebrity, don't we? There's a lot of celebrity worship in our culture. And, and I love a good character actor. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to think of, I probably don't know who the best character actors are, but Tom Hanks, right? He's Sully, he's Captain Phillips, he's... Some dude on an island talking to a volleyball. He's Mr. Rogers. You know what I mean? And he, he's one of those guys that kind of like bleeds into the character. You forget it's Tom Hanks and he kind of becomes that guy, right? Phenomenal actor. And, and how many of you like me have ever been in a place, I love movies. I've always loved movies since I was a kid. Where you go to a film, you see the leading man, and, and the guy is just portraying. He's, he's this guy with incredible honor and integrity, and self-sacrifice, and he does these remarkable things, and, and maybe the screenplay is, is written or based on the, the life of a real human being who actually did remarkable things, and it's being portrayed in this movie, and Hollywood is telling this story, and you got a great actor with a good score and a good screenplay and some good cinematography, and you put it together, and if you're anything like me, when I sit in a movie like that, I walk out, I'm like, wow, like totally impacted, that was amazing. Life-changing, right? And then you're standing in the grocery store and you pick up some garbage magazine and you're like, man, 
That dude cheated on his wife, trashed a hotel room, and is checking into rehab for the third time, right? So his publicist can say it's not his fault. You're like, what happened to that awesome dude that was like this honorable man? He played such a, well, it's, he's an actor, right? He's an actor. He's not actually that dude. He's pretending to be that dude. And, and, and we associate that with, with the actor, don't we? I mean, if you hop on a plane in New York City and it takes off and has a major malfunction over the Hudson and you look down the aisle and you see Tom Hanks sitting there, that's a problem. You actually want Sully, right? <laughs> and Jesus here is, is addressing our, our personal piety and it seems as though it's almost in contradiction with, um, almost in contradiction to what he said earlier where he talked about displaying your good works before men so that they would honor your Father in heaven. And here he, he addresses something totally different. He, he says, he says I, want you to, I want you to do this in private and not do it in front of men. You know, didn't he say earlier, let your light shine before men so their good works are seen and a watching world will give honor to God. And here Jesus speaks of a certain spiritual practice, not to be done before a watching world, but to be done in private. And, and what we see here is, as Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is addressing how, what real righteousness looks, at, looks like, what he's getting to is what God's always cared about. He's getting to our hearts. He's getting to genuineness. What, what is the motive? What is the intent? And as we read this passage, we see that's what God cares about. When you, when you see this word hypocrisy, um, Jesus goes after the Pharisees. And as you read the first four, four, first four verses, sorry, um, he, he compares the righteous person to the hypocrite. You know, and before the word hypocrite was this pejorative term that we know it to today, in the ancient world, hypocrite was an actor. It was the theater. That's where the word comes from. And so what Jesus is saying is, as I'm going to talk about, as I'm going to preach about, as I'm going to describe to you what real righteousness looks like, don't be like an actor. Don't be like the Pharisees who do these things for the purpose of uh, other people's praise because they're just acting. They're just pretending. It's actually not genuine. It's actually not real. Something real is not going on in their hearts. They're like a hypocrite. They're like a, a theater actor as they sound the trumpets when they give alms to the poor, as they pray loudly in front of other people and, and walk through all these meaningless phrases describing their own piety out loud as they pray so that everybody can hear what they're saying, as they walk through the streets and throw on some makeup so they little, look a little bit more white and a little bit more gaunt. So people will see them and say, wow, that Pharisee must really be fasting, must not be eating, must be praying. They pray so remarkably. Look at them when they give this money in front, in front of all the people. And Jesus says, that's not real. That's fake. And they already have their reward. God rejects that. How remarkable that two people could be doing the exact same thing, giving money to help the poor, and for one, purpose, for one person, it's God-glorifying act of worship and sacrifice. And for another person, it's sinful hypocrisy. And the difference is their heart. It's their intent. Someone could give thousands of dollars to charity. And another person could give five bucks out of her purse and for the, for the person given the five dollars, it's an act of God-glorifying worship because of her heart. And for the dude given thousands, it's an act of sinful hypocrisy. Jesus is getting at the heart. He's getting at genuineness. Don't be an actor. Don't play pretend. You know, in the church, in the church we seek sometimes a greater piety than we possess. You know, if, if a great character actor is great in the movies or in the theater, it's wonderful and it's entertaining. If someone in the life of the church is portraying a greater, greater piety, piety than they possess, it's actually ghastly and repulsive. God, as he always has, Jesus in this sermon, is getting at our hearts. 
He's, he's saying, you know, I, I, I care about intent. I care about what you're doing. I care about, as you read this passage, look at this. Beware of practice, practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So, so what we see here is that the intent isn't what? The intent isn't to give to God and to glorify him. The intent is what? To be seen. To be seen by other people. So when we come to worship, when we give, when we engage in what would have been a, a very common act of piety in, in Jewish antiquity would be to give alms to the poor. It would be to either give to the synagogue so that they would give to the needy or it would be to give directly to a beggar on the street. And what we see is a picture of, of the hypocrites. We see a picture of the actor, the Pharisees that would sound. No, there's no real documentation of them actually sounding trumpets. And what we see here probably is Jesus is using hyperbole. Like you're acting so much that it's as if you're having people sound trumpets around you so that everybody looks when you give your money. Because your goal in your heart is to be seen, not to actually worship and serve and give. And Jesus calls it out. He says, this is disgusting. This is hypocrisy. This, is, this isn't worship. We've seen this before uh, in, in Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, right? We see Cain brought his sacrifice, and he actually... He, he, he brought his sacrifice, and Abel brought his sacrifice. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, and he rejected Cain's sacrifice. And we see in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, that it was because Abel, Abel gave in faith, and Cain didn't. Abel, Abel was coming in faith to sacrifice to God. It wasn't, it wasn't the type of sacrifice that he gave. God accepted blood sacrifices and grain sacrifices. It was the heart behind Abel's sacrifice as opposed to Cain's. And here we see it again as Jesus is walking through the Sermon on the Mount, getting at the heart, getting in our faith. Isn't it one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest criticisms of the church, right? Is that it's full of hypocrites, right? I and mean, I think my whole life I've grown up and heard that. Oh, you know, church is full of hypocrites. I love D. James Kennedy said, uh, you know, someone came and said, you know, I don't want to go to the church. It's full of hypocrites. And he said, that's all right. There's always room for one more. <laughs> if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it, right? In fact, for us to be hypocritical is, deny, is to deny the fact that we're sinful. The reality is we, we fall so short of this. Jesus displays real righteousness and preaches about real righteousness on the sermon, gives them a picture of not what they've seen from the Pharisees and the teachers and the scribes as, as this fake hypocritical uh, theater actor type righteousness, but he cuts to the heart of what God really loves and what really is righteousness. And he says, it's not about you uh, displaying this, these great pieties before men, but it's about your heart. It's about what's real. It's about what's genuine. It's about what you do in private. If you do it for the purpose of of displaying it before men, then you have your reward, which isn't much. It's whatever people say, oh, wow, they're wonderful. But if you do it with the right heart, if you do it in faith like Abel did, if you do it in private where your audience isn't that people would see you, but your only audience is God, and I'm doing it for him, and no one else needs to know but him, then God will reward you. That's good news. Here's the reality, is that the church is full of sinners. The church is full of hypocrites. We struggle with this, the reality of this righteousness. Acknowledging that is really a prerequisite to joining the church, right? It's the only organization where you have to acknowledge the fact that you fall short and that you're a sinner and that often you're hypocritical to even be a part of it. And so we sit here and we recognize as we hear the words of Jesus Man, my motives aren't always right. My intent isn't always good. Oh, Lord. And that's why we do our prayer of confession. We come before the Lord and we say, God, sometimes we give for people to see us and not for you to see us. Sometimes we do things out of selfish motivation instead of the right, righteous type of motivation. 
Sometimes we're not living a faithful life. We're not exercising uh, obligations of piety for, for your glory, but we're doing it for ours. We have the ability to come before him and recognize in a non-hypocritical way that we're sinners. To be real, to be genuine. John chapter 4, God is, is looking for those who worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. He's not interested in a really good-looking, well-acted, fake worship. Isn't that great about him? That God's not interested in our ability to act and look good. But he's interested in our hearts. He's interested in real worship genuine worship. And you know what, folks? For us, sometimes that's coming before the, God, the Lord and repenting of sin. Laying your heart bare before him. Acknowledging the fact that I've been hypocritical. I've been sinful. And God, I need your grace. I love that Jesus gets at this. It must have been remarkable for them to hear it at the time. Here, They've, they've walked the streets and gone to synagogue and engaged in religious activity and looked up to those who walk around looking like they're fasting, who pray aloud, who give so much, envying them. And Jesus flips it on his head. He says, don't envy that. That's acting. There's nothing going on inside. That's a whitewashed tomb. It looks good on the outside. It's all dead on the inside. How about the person who gives in private? Whose intent isn't for everybody to see him and think he's great. How about the person who's not putting on a show? But whose heart is genuinely looking to glorify God and give and serve and help. And now we're going to see over the next few weeks Jesus walk through giving here in prayer and fasting. In a way that's real, in a way that's genuine, in a way that's truthful. I can't help but think uh, of grace alone, sola gratia. The old adage there, but for the grace of God, go I. I think there's room for humility in this passage. For us to recognize this area of our heart introspectively. I don't think we're supposed to hear this passage and be like, yeah, I know those people. Oh, yeah, I know those people that are always putting on a religious show. Man, I really can spot that religious phony, that fake person who just comes to church and dresses up and wants everybody to think everything's going on good in life, right? We see it all the time. It's amazing how awesome people's lives are on Facebook, right? They are having a blast. They're always having a good time. Like, in yeah, the split-second selfie, everything looked great right before the fight, Right? If you watch people's lives via social media, you would think everybody other than you is just doing wonderful. That's why everyone's stressed out. Everyone else is doing great. Why are we always fighting? There's room here for recognition, introspection. Not, hey, look at those fake dudes who are super pious. I think this passage calls us to not look at someone next to you, which is our tendency. Jesus is speaking to you. Jesus is speaking to me. What's going on in my heart? What's going on in my heart when I give? And here, listen, I think what the temptation could be for some of us is to be like, you know what? My motives aren't very pure. I don't think I have a really perfectly pure motive in my giving, so I'm just not going to give. <laughs> Do the right thing and let God work on your motives. Amen? That's not what this passage is saying. You know, I think I'm just going to be stingy from now on. I'm not going to be generous because every time I'm generous, I really just want credit. Okay, that's not what this is getting at. God's calling us to generosity. God's calling us to sacrificial giving. But God's also calling us to recognize where we fall short, the depth of our sin, and, and, to, and to drive into him for pure motives. God, change my heart. I repent. Turn me and I'll be turned. I want to I give, live with an open hand, be generous, help those in need, and live sacrificially. And at the same time, I'm, I'm worshiping you and reaching out to you to fix my heart and to adjust my motives as I walk through sanctification and I'm not perfect. Amen? But this is definitely a passage that's calling us towards introspection. 
I love, uh, I love Winston Churchill quotes. And uh, <laughs> he said, uh, he ran into a, a very, very arrogant, pompous guy who was bragging, and Churchill looked at him and he said, there for the grace of God goes God. Is he, is he addressed the guy? <laughs> Hopefully that's not someone, something someone could say of us. I think there's something about the gospel and the reality of this Sermon on the Mount that, that produces in us humility and a recognition of where we need to move in repentance. He goes on to say, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I've seen people twist themselves into crazy knots trying to, in a very detailed, practical way, live into this passage. You actually can't split your brain in half and not have your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So everybody just relax a little bit, all right? <laughs> I've seen people try to do things and in living into this verse that, that don't make sense. What Jesus is getting at, what Jesus is getting at is, is this is something that, that as you give, it's not about something to be public. It's not about something to portray when you give and you give alms or you give to the poor or you reach out to the needy. It's something that you can kind of do in a secret way, in a private way, so that God's only the audience. And he's describing, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, to depict this idea of, of you're going to do this privately and you don't need to tell anybody and you don't need to let anyone know that I'm the one who gave it. Because this is really about my worship of God. This, this also doesn't mean that you never do things publicly. As, as I stated before, Jesus talked a lot about displaying your righteousness before men so that God is glorified. What this is getting at is your heart. It's getting at your motive. Why are you doing it? Why am I doing it? Am I doing it so men see it and glorify me? Or am I doing this so that God is glorified? Amen? Amen. We are to show mercy, to speak truth so that others notice the integrity of our character. But also, particularly as we see here in verses 1 through 16 in areas of personal piety, this practice is to be done in private. We're not to sound the trumpets. We're getting at our intent. We're getting at the spirit behind giving. Jesus is going after the heart. What are we giving for? Does the world think you're great, or are you concerned about God being glorified? This is the point of this passage. An offering of sacrifice, uh, where the purpose is to inflate the ego of the giver, that person, they already have their reward. His reward is not much. But those who boast about their giving, who parade it, who want their name in lights, they've already received the reward. If you give in private, God knows. If you exercise these things in private, it's not that nobody knows, because God knows. And that's all that matters. He's your, aud he's your audience. And as this passage teaches us, God will openly reward you if it's about him knowing and not everybody else knowing. He'll do it directly. He'll do it himself. And folks, at the end of the day, listen, you can't outgive God. He's already given us everything. There's a time when it becomes apparent to every Christian at some point in their life. As God illuminates the scriptures, and you can read it over and over again in the life of the reformers, whether it be Luther or any of them. And you, and you Christians, should know this moment in your own life. When you reflect on the scriptures, when God moves on your heart, when he illuminates the scriptures to you, and at some point you realize that you need a righteousness. You and I need a righteousness that far exceeds our own. Have you reached that moment? Where you, the, you, you look at the reality of who God is, 
You look at the scriptures and the reality of the depravity of our own sin, the depth of our own sin, and you come to a very personal realization. When you hear Jesus preach about what real righteousness looks like, what our heart is supposed to be doing in these moments, and you maybe come to a a realization, you come to a moment inside yourself when you go, wow, I'm not that. I'm sinful, I'm bent, and I need, I need a righteousness that far exceeds my own. Have you been there? And I can't earn it by going to church. I can't earn it by reading my Bible. I can't earn it by giving money to people. I can't earn it by fasting. I can't earn it by praying. I can't earn it by doing any of these things because I just can't do it even with the right intent. Even when I do those good things, I do them sometimes at least partially for bad motives. I fall short. The moment we come to see we can be counted We fall short, but we can be counted righteous, not because of what we've done, but by faith alone in Jesus Christ, because of his work, is a great moment. Amen? When we come to the end of ourselves and realize we need a righteousness that is greater than our own, but then the good news hits us and we see the gospel displayed before us, and we can be accounted righteous, not because we did things from pure motives, but because of Jesus Christ. Faith alone in Jesus Christ, his alien righteousness is attributed to us. He became our substitute, paid the price for our sin, lived this righteous life as he's describing in the Sermon on the Mount perfectly. And now our righteousness that falls so short is paid for and we are attributed to us, his righteousness, on our account because of what he's done on the cross. How many of you guys believe that's good news this morning? And we get this not through religious actions, not from portraying that we're so pious and we do so much and we give so much money and we pray so well and so eloquently. We can sit in our Bible study and when the leader of the Bible study brings up a verse, we know the four or five coolest things to say about that verse that other people don't know. Listen, that's all acting. What's going on in our hearts? Guess what? The only one that can change our hearts is Jesus through his grace and through his gospel. And in light of the reality of that righteousness from him that's attributed to us, now we can pursue living the way Jesus describes righteousness, genuinely, not as actors, but being real before God in our worship. Because the only thing that matters in light of the gospel is that he gets the glory, not us. Amen? It's good news. It's free isn't it? Hey, listen, church, you don't have to pretend. You don't have to look good when you walk in here. You don't have to be the dude that just fakely worships better than everybody else. It doesn't matter because Jesus is our righteousness. We can genuinely worship him from a pure heart and in the areas we fall short, repent and ask him to turn us because our sin is paid for and our righteousness is his. Amen? And so Jesus says, worship me in spirit and truth. Be real. You don't need to be an actor. You don't need to be fake. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. It matters what I think. Great news. Who wants to act anyway? Who wants to pretend? Jesus is after genuine hearts who worship an audience of one. Not for self-praise, but for God's glory. Folks, listen to me as you hear this. To the degree each of us falls short of this, Jesus doesn't. He's lived this perfectly. And because of the cross of Jesus Christ, his righteousness is yours. Amen? The reality of that freedom, the reality of that forgiveness should drive us to a life of grateful worship that begins to look a lot like this. Because now he's writing his law on our hearts. He's changing our hearts. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. Amen? Let's pray.
Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who came and perfectly displayed you. He is the representation. He is God. He's the perfect, accessible representation of God for us. Thank you that he, he in, his, in your word, he has described for us what, what it really looks like to be righteous. Not to be a fake actor, but to be the authentic thing. And at the end of the day, the perfectly authentic real thing was him. We strive for that not because we're earning something, but because we've received your free gift of salvation. Your righteousness is ours, and now we pursue it because it's so much better. We pursue pursue it because you're the only one who deserves the glory. We pursue it not because we're concerned about an audience of men and women liking us. We're concerned about you, your glory. Get at our hearts this morning. Change our hearts as we engage in acts of prayer and fasting and giving. Let us do it for your glory. Let us demonstrate what it means to really worship you. Not for people to see, but for you to see. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand together as, as we sing and uh, continue our worship service. Um, as we do that, as you stand with me this morning, uh, we're going to pray for one of our partner churches, and we're going to just let you know that we're not pa- passing the offering this morning. If you, if you give... Uh, particularly through check or cash. You can do that at the boxes in the back on your way out. And uh, we're just grateful for that. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer as we pray for our partner church of whom I forgot it, who it is. So I will ask Mike right now. The neighborhood church. The neighborhood church. Let's pray for them. Amen. Should have wrote that down. Second thought. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for your incredible grace. We give. As an act of worship, cheerfully, recognizing everything comes from you. We give not for people to see, but for you to see. We give as an act of worship because we recognize at the end of the day, our resources weren't just about our effort, but really your blessing. We recognize in scripture it's found true joy and better to give than to receive. Help us as our hearts are adjusted to see needs, to open our lives and our homes and our resources to meet them as we display your glory, not for our name to be great, but for your name to be great in this place. God, we pray for the neighborhood church that that would be the reality there as well as we partner with other churches because our heart isn't to be the church. Our heart is to be the church, not renovation, but be the church in this area. Our heart is that the gospel would go out and be accessible to every man, woman, and child in this area. And so, God, we need the neighborhood church to proclaim your gospel effectively. Bless the pastor there. Bless the people there. Help them to be effective. Help them to grow. We trust you for that church, that more and more people would hear your word and respond to it. In Jesus' name, amen.